Hey, uh, take your Bibles, turn to, um, we're going to turn to Matthew, Matthew chapter 18. Tonight I'm sharing a message called an Upside Down Kingdom. We got it all situated. I think you're off a little bit, Brian. There we go. <laughs> all right. Upside Down Kingdom. We live in an upside down world trying to live upright lives, it's kinda, kinda difficult. We live in a world where, as you know, it's right, right's become wrong and wrong has become right and uh, we're not sure what we're able to say or not say and still be okay. It's, it's hard. There's a world out there that lives one way and we've got a, a book that tells us to live a, a completely different way. You see, Jesus taught a little bit of living upside down. And we're living upside down from the way our culture is. So if our culture is upside down and we're living upside down from the way they are, that makes us right side up. Is that right? So Billy Sunday said the world is wrong side up. It needs to be turned upside down in order to be right side up. And so that is our job, is how do we live in such a world like this to live according to the plan that God has for us and be able to live a life that's honoring and pleasing to him and effective to do that. So in a, a, much of Jesus' teaching was very counterculture. And we're gonna, we're gonna look at a few of those verses, but I wanna start with Matthew chapter 18 and read the first four verses for you. And... Uh, the disciples were arguing about who was most important. Verse one says, about that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him and he put the child among them. He just set a child right in, in the midst of, of the disciples. And then he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you turn from your sins, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. You realize how tough that is? Unless we turn from our sins and unless we become like little children, we will not be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you understand that? <laughs> is that hard to understand? For one, we've gotta turn from our sins. We cannot any longer go down the path of sin. We've got to turn from our sins and become like little children if we're going to get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child, the one that he put in the midst, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' world, to be great, you've got to be small. To be great, you've got to be like a child. So we look at this passage and there's two main elements that are there. One we see is definitely children and the other element is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said we must become like little children. And I know you've read things like this but I always think it's interesting to come across you know, things that, that children say. They say some interesting things. And so I just wanna share a couple of these with you. A little girl with a wild imagination says, uh, this story says, a few months back, my wife showed a picture of herself to our three-year-old daughter. In the picture, my wife is about seven years old. And they asked this little three-year-old girl, do you know who this is? And the daughter gasps, that's me when I'm bigger. <laughs> Isn't that interesting to think that a child would actually think that that would be possible, that I could see myself four years from now. Uh, the logic of children uh, this man says, my son, when he was six, said, Dad, can we get a cat? And he said, and he says, your mom is allergic to cats, so no. And the son says, when mom dies, can we get a cat? <laughs> and he said, sure. <laughs> Sometimes uh, your children have to set parents straight. Uh, this one says, this morning my wife told my three-year-old daughter that owls were nocturnal. And my daughter responded, yes, owls are not turtles. <laughs> it's good.
My son and I are playing catch and I have a terrible throw that sails over his head and I say, sorry, that was a bad throw. He stops and gives me a kind look and says, no daddy, that was a wonderful throw. Then he takes two steps towards getting the ball and stops again and turns back around and says, when we say something nice, even when we don't mean it at all, that's called being polite, right dad? <laughs> they, kinda, they kinda learn some things that uh, Sometimes they're pretty, pretty wise. Well, what does Jesus mean when he says um, we need to be, become like a child? Certainly he doesn't think that we're supposed to go back to acting and being like kindergartners to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Are we supposed to abandon everything that we've learned through our life that has brought us to what, what makes us adults? What does he mean when he says we ought to become like little children. What are, what are some characteristics of children? Children are, they're little. Children are short. Some of them wear diapers. Some of them drool. Some suck their thumbs. And they fall down a lot. Is that what he means? He's not telling us that in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, we've got to be short to wear diapers and drool. He's not talking about the external characteristics of children, he's talking about the internal nature. So think about a child, a child, children, most children are, are very, very sincere. Children don't have agendas. They're not, they're not sly, they're not devious. They learn those things, but they're not that way. If a child says, I want a cookie, what do you think they mean? I want a cookie, now. <laughs> that's, just, that's just it, it's pretty simple. Children are totally dependent, and children are helpless. Children need protection, children need love, and children need safety. Children are full of love for others. You catch eyes with a small child and what do you get? Most often you get a, a big smile. Just yesterday we were at Zach and Marin's and having a birthday party for, for Barrett and uh, I got one of those big, wide open mouth, slobbery, wet kisses right on the side of my face. And I'd have to say there almost isn't anything greater than to get a big, wet, sloppy kiss from your grandson. Those kisses are, are pretty, pretty phenomenal. Is that what we're talking about? You see, children uh, are full of love and children I, I think are a lot like a jar. And um, they're just waiting to be filled up with love. It's, it's easy. Uh, Zach mentioned a couple of weeks ago, you know, the way, to, the way to get friends or the way to get notice is just walk around with a stroller, just put a blanket over a stroller. People are attracted to children. Children brings something out in us, and, but I, they're, like a, they're like a jar that is just waiting to be filled up and poured love into them, and that love, when their jar is full, spills out to others. So the disciples, they were arguing, and they were talking to Jesus about who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so they were trying to interpret this whole idea, the message of the kingdom, based on what the world had taught them. They were confusing the kingdom of heaven with all the many kingdoms of the world. In Adam Clark's commentary in the Bible, he, he writes this, he says, be as truly, talking about being a child, be as truly without worldly ambition and the lust of power as little children are who act among themselves as if all were equal. You put children in a room, last Sunday night, Jeannie and I were in the nursery and we had three little ones in the nursery they all play, doesn't matter what age they are, they just all play and they all wanna, there's a little bit of jealousy that he has what I want and that type of thing, but they're all on equal, they're all on equal ground. You, you look at children and children, one thing that they're, they're free of until they learn this whole thing about I want this, they, they don't, they're not all about greed. If you put a, a, a pile of, of gold and a pile of silver and a pile of dirt which one do you think a small child is gonna go to? 
They, they might see the shininess of gold or silver, but I guarantee you dirt is a whole lot more fun. How many of you have been at t-ball games? You know, we're talking five, six-year-olds. They're out there playing baseball. Not really. I, I have vivid pictures in my head of being at my children's t-ball games, and, and there's uh, somebody sitting at, at shortstop, just sitting there raking up dirt with their hat upside down on the ground, piling dirt in their hat. You know, we're supposed to be playing baseball, but that's, I, I've seen too many of those pictures. Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven is not about status. It's not about accomplishments or possessions or achievements. We need to come as little children. Back in the book of 1 Samuel, where Samuel is anointing a king to follow Saul, and you know this story pretty well, verse seven, uh, Samuel sees one of Jesse's sons, and right before this he gets to Eliab, and he's thinking, surely this is the one. But verse seven, the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord does what? He looks at the heart, he knows the heart. The kingdom of heaven is an upside down kingdom, and if we were to truly grasp the message of becoming like little children, then we pretty much have to reject everything that the world has taught us. See, the world tells us that only the strong survive. The world tells us that beautiful people are the ones that matter most. The world tells us that physical strength and intellectual ability are what's gonna get you ahead in life. But I want you to listen to the words of young David. David, this one that Samuel anointed as king as he speaks to King Saul, and he's speaking to King Saul about the big giant Goliath. And after um, all of Saul's warriors are, are too afraid to go out and face this giant and David, the little brother, is just bringing some food out to his brothers on the battlefield, this conversation uh, strikes up this conversation with King Saul and uh, verse, chapter 17, verse 32 of 1 Samuel. He says, don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. And Saul's first reaction is to say, don't be ridiculous, don't be ridiculous. There is no way that you're gonna be able to fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. That's what qualifies him to go fight the giant. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said, and when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this with both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Pretty simple, isn't it? That guy is mocking God, and he needs to stop. And since none of the rest of you are gonna do that, I'll go do it. I take care of my dad's sheep and goats. I'll take care of the giant. And of course Saul's going, no way. And you know the story, he's like, here, take my armor. If you're gonna go out, take my armor. David tries putting the armor on, but he, it's too big and clumsy, he's not used to it, so he says, I'm just gonna go with what I'm comfortable with, with my slingshot and a couple stones. Simple faith. Little guy, see David, David was the youngest of the brothers, he wasn't the tallest, he wasn't the strongest, he wasn't the best looking of his brothers. But here's the truth that I want you to hear tonight. God doesn't love us because we're valuable. We're valuable because God loves us. What gives you value, what gives you purpose, what gives you meaning is not your abilities. It's the fact that God loves you. He's chosen to love you and he will forever love you. Do you think that God is um, impressed with all of your list of accomplishments? I'm sure we all have many things that we can list of this is what I've done and this is what I've achieved. But re in reality, how impressed do you think God is about those things? He's, he's probably a proud father 
I'm sure, you know, he's the one that gave us those abilities, but he's not impressed with our power. He's not impressed with our accomplishments. Our pride and our ambition are, are, are pretty much a hindrance to what God wants to do and his ability to use us. He could do a whole lot more through us. He could do a whole lot more in us if we were to simply just yield ourselves to him and humbly come before him. He can do a whole lot more through that than a person who has a lot of accomplishments uh, and things to their name that they're all filled with pride about. You see, the kingdom of heaven is, it's upside down. It's an upside down kingdom. As you read through the Bible, you see over and over things get turned around, backwards, upside down. Here's some things that Jesus said, Matthew 20, 16. The first will be last, and the last will be first. Upside down. He said that whoever wants to be great ought to be a servant. That's, that's upside down thinking. In our mind, you want to be great, you gotta, you gotta be at the top. Jesus said if you want to be great, be at the bottom. Paul said that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and the weak things of this world to shame the strong. Paul also tells us that Jesus was equal to God, but Jesus emptied himself and made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 9, uh, Paul says that Jesus was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that through his poverty we might become rich. You see, Jesus came from his place in heaven to earth. Was he poor? Was he really that poor? Well, I think the poorness that we're talking about is the fact that he was in heaven and had everything and he emptied himself and came to earth to become a man. Uh, That's a step down, a big step down. He came from heaven to earth and on earth he went to a cross in order that we might become his righteousness, that we might become rich. So after a while of hearing these things, and we who have grown up in church, we understand this kind of thinking, right? We get used to this pattern that uh, uh, things that make a person important in our world become unimportant in this upside down kingdom. Jesus says whoever wants to be great has to be the least. If you want to be first, you gotta be, you gotta be last. The things that uh, seem weak and humble and poor are the things that make people better and are the things that draw us closer to the heart of God. And yet there's some surprises that that he gives us in this upside down kingdom. Acts 20 verse 35, um, Paul remembers Jesus' words where he says it's better to give than to receive. Let me read that verse, he says, I've been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I think selfish people would have a hard time making it in an upside down kingdom. See, in in our world we need givers. We need people who sacrifice and many of you, that's what you do. You give time, you give your talent, you give of your treasures to make this world a better place, to make the church a better place. God so loved the world that he he gave. He gave his one and only son. And when we give, we're following the example of God. But there's a twist, there's a little bit of a surprise. Because while it's more blessed to give than to, this mic is just, is it annoying all of you guys? What do I need to do, Matt? He's gonna come, he's gonna come dress me here. It's just popping and doing stuff. Should I just get rid of it? it I won't throw it away. (laughs) Fix it so we don't have to deal with that anymore. Okay, no more problems? problems. Give Matt a hand. All right. I don't know how many of you wore a headset mic like this before, but it, it's, it, it's annoying. 
just to be honest with you. So, but Matt's here to win the day, save the day. Um, where was I at? There's a twist. It's more blessed to give than to receive, but here's, here's a twist that uh, Jesus throws into this whole thing, is that uh, in order uh, for us to uh, be, be givers, we have to first learn what, it's, what, what it means to receive. We have to be receivers before we are givers, yet the scripture says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, before we give, we have to learn to, to take. Here's the thing. I don't know how many of you uh, real are, are, have experienced this. It's, it's a hard thing to receive. How many, how many of you say it's a whole lot more fun to give a present than to receive a present? I, I, there's gonna be mixed responses. How many say it's more, more easier to give than to receive? Okay, how many of you say it's a whole lot of fun and you'd rather receive than give? Come on, you're here. There's a few, come on. We all love to receive gifts, but you know, why is it so hard, why is it that we love giving more than receiving, okay? I want you to, it, our culture, if we are receiving, okay, if we're, if we're the, on the receiving end, it makes us look a little bit weak. Think about it, we're, we're in need. If I give, it makes me look strong. If I have something that you need, I look stronger than you. When I give, I look generous. When I'm generous, it makes me feel good. When we offer somebody a willing hand or a word of encouragement, we've, we've done what the Lord's will is. He wants us to be kind and, and compassionate and generous and giving just like him. But we can, give, we can mess up our giving. We can give our attention to people who don't really need our attention and ignore people who do need. Think about our giving. Um, we, can, we can give but do it in a, in, a, in a way that is totally patronizing of people and make them feel like they, that they wish we hadn't even bothered giving to them. It's a, it's, a, it's a hard thing, but what if you have nothing to give? You see, there's some people who have to give and some people don't, that don't. What if you've been on the receiving end all the time? You're the one who's always receiving. Maybe you feel a little bit passive or a little bit dependent. It's hard. When you're in need, it's hard to, to receive something. Although you know that you need it, it's hard to accept something. Think about it, put yourself in that place. If you have to hold out uh, your, peop- your hands to people all the time, you, you think that would be easy to do. A lot of people are worried about becoming dependent. Just recently um, got a, uh, purchased a long-term care policy. Thinking about, you know, what, what happens to me when I get older and, uh, you know, I wanna make sure that, you know, my family doesn't have to take, take care of me. You know, if there's something tragic, drastic that happens, there's, there's a plan in place that can take care of me for a period of time, and when the money runs out, then they can just throw me out in the alley and forget it at that point. But um, we, we think about these things because we don't like this thought of, I'm gonna be dependent on somebody else. What if I get sick and strangers have to give me a bath? Or what if I, what if I become paralyzed and, and other people have to feed me like a child? We don't, we don't like the thoughts of that. That doesn't make us feel real good. Dependency that, uh, can be a feeling that, that, that feels not so good. There's this stigma around this whole idea of dependency. Who, who wants to be dependent? We've been raised all of our life to, to, to be independent, to take care of ourselves. We've been told that it's more blessed to give than to receive, that it's a whole lot easier to give. If we're giving, we have some power. If we're giving, we have options. If we're a giver, um, we can choose to be kind, like, like God. But Jesus tells us that we need to first be receivers. And this is the scripture, Luke 18, 17, where Jesus said, I tell you the truth, another one of these truth-telling things. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. We have to receive the kingdom of God. So think of what he's saying here. Getting into the kingdom begins with us holding out our hands. 
I think a, a reason why a lot of people have a hard time offering their life to Christ is because for me to do so is to admit, first of all, that I'm wrong. I have to admit that I'm in need. I have to admit that I need something else than what I have myself. I have to come saying, here I am, and I need somebody or something else. And for a lot of people, that's a really, really hard thing to do. It's a really hard thing to offer your life to someone or something else. It's hard because we're grown-ups and we're taught to take responsibility for ourselves, to work hard, to be disciplined. That's, that's how we as grown-ups get ahead. That's what we're taught. But according to Jesus, we first have to r- roll back our grown-up habits and become like a child. There's a lot of, a lot of sweet things that we can say about children. I, I love Barrett's roly-poly little pudgy legs, chubby cheeks. I like the, the wet, sloppy kisses. I like the smiles. Think about those things, you know, kids smile at us just because we look goofy at them. It, it does a lot for us. They're, they're a picture of innocence, just the innocence of a child. And I think the temptation or where we often go with this whole thing about becoming like a child is we make it about this, this idea of being innocent. And we think, how in the world can I do that? How can I go backwards in time and become innocent and pure again? We lose a lot of innocence as we grow up, right? We get to a place where we feel like we we know too much, we've seen too much, we've said too much. But Jesus didn't talk about children because they're sweet and innocent. What he was talking about children and saying we have to receive the kingdom as as a child is because a child is a picture of need. They're a little bundle of need. They are totally dependent. A child cannot make it on their own. Think about a a baby, how often we have to change diapers. They don't eat unless we put something in their mouth. They are 100% completely, utterly dependent. Up until what age? That's pretty debatable. (laughs) 32? I don't know. But, but think of it, not as just this picture of innocence, but the, but the picture of, of a package of need. Unless we come to the Lord in this way. You see, in Jesus' day, they didn't have families with designer children. They didn't, they didn't have families that were child-centered. A child was simply another mouth to feed. A child was, was uh, there for a few years without even being able to milk a goat, to build a fence, to prune a vine. Children can't produce anything. And in a culture where, where everything is about work and what you do, you think about all the years that they sit around and do nothing. They just lay around or play or whatever they do all day long. There's just one thing that they're really good at, one thing that they're better than us, that they can teach us this lesson, is that she, children, and Jesus points to this fact, children are great receivers. They know, or whether they know or not, they just, they're just in need and all they do is receive all the time. And so Jesus says, unless and until we become like children, that's what we need to become. We need to become children who are hungry. Hungry for the things of God. Hungry for his love. Are we hungry for God's love? for his grace, hungry for his forgiveness, hungry for his guidance, hungry for his mercy, hungry for a close relationship, a close walk with God. You see, when you're a hungry receiver, God will meet your need. And unless we become like little children, he can't meet the needs because when we're too strong or too independent 
we're not open to receive. I can do it myself. When your children start saying things like, oh, no, I can do it myself. You know, we think that's a step up. It's, it, and when you think about it, it's almost like a step, step down. They, and I know when they say, I can do it myself, I know. All my children, they hit a point where they say, I can do it myself. I know they can't, but they're gonna try. I think too often we approach God with this attitude or this perspective, this idea that I can do it myself. And really what we're saying is, I, I, don't, I don't need you. And Jesus is saying, the way that you're really gonna become great, the way that you're gonna be able to receive the kingdom is to come like a child and be a receiver of all the good things that God has for his children. If only we could learn to be like little children. If only we could be sincere receivers of all that God has for us. We could be sincere seekers of God. If we could learn how to be totally dependent on God, and what does that look like? If only we could learn to be free from greed and selfish ambition, then perhaps we would understand what Jesus is telling to the disciples and speaking in turn to us that whoever humbles himself like this child, the child that he set in, 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 in the midst of them and said, until you become like this child, the innocent, but yet the one who is dependent, that is the greatest in the kingdom of God. So we live in this world where we're all about independence. And in this upside down kingdom, Jesus is saying, you need to learn to be dependent. Yes, it's more blessed to give than to receive. But what we need to learn first is to be receivers. We need, and I wanna encourage you tonight to become like a child. I want you to stand with me. The musicians are gonna come. What is the, the posture of a child when they need something? That's what they do, right? Why is it that when we worship, one of the expressions that we have of worship is this. Why do you think that is? I need you. How many of you need Jesus? How many of you feel like maybe there's a little bit too much independence going on? And you've been approaching a lot of things in life and I think we're struggling because we miss opportunities. We miss opportunities all day long. We miss opportunities in our corporate settings because the Lord is here and he wants to meet needs. He wants to do the things that we need for him to do. And we, uh, instead, of, instead of coming like this, we're, we're more like this. And we're really more saying, I can do it myself. That's good information but I'll do it myself. And I wanna challenge you tonight. We're gonna to end just with uh, a worship song. We're gonna open the altars and we're gonna pray. And it's seven o'clock, it's a little after seven. So if you have a child in nursery, you can go get the, them. Um, and if you need to leave, you're welcome to do that. We're just gonna open the altars and spend some time praying. And what I would love more than anything is for us to learn to be dependent, receivers, from the Lord. Would you close your eyes and just open your heart, maybe lift your hands. If you have a hard time lifting your hands and you just go, that's ah, just a weird thing for me to do. Think about a child and say, I'm gonna become like a child. Unless I humble myself and become like a child, I can't receive the kingdom. I don't wanna miss it. God, I wanna be totally dependent on you. And so we open our hearts, we open our lives, we open our arms wide to you, saying, Jesus, we need you more than anything. May we not be guilty of saying, I can do it myself. 
I'm independent. I'm on my own here. Lord, forgive us of that attitude. Help us to be like little children, dependent completely on you. In Jesus' name, amen.